let me first start out with um, uh, some uh, advice from one of the uh, camp counselors, uh, um, if you think of this as a summer camp. So my bit of advice in getting started for this uh, week is that uh, I don't know how, how many of you have been uh, camping or hiking, uh, and you get on a trail and you get far enough away from where you parked your car, and suddenly there's that wonderful moment where there's no cell signal. And suddenly the people you're traveling with aren't looking down at their phone uh, while they're hiking uh, because it doesn't help any. Uh, uh, and they're not, they're not catching Pokemon. Um, they're, they're actually looking up at, at sort of what's happening. And so my, my bit of advice as we get started is that there's an, a tremendous amount of material that you will cover in the next uh, more than a week, 10 days or, or, uh, or so. And it is easy to fall into the path of checking your email and getting on chat and getting distracted. But there's a, there are many speakers here who are world-renowned speakers who have come quite a distance, and you guys have come quite a distance from different countries, from different parts of the US, and you have a week plus here. I, I heartily recommend, turn your email off to the breaks, okay? turn the chat window off, and really attempt to soak in with as much thinking and understanding of what is, what's the core concept that's getting shared as possible. And I'm gonna just start off with a couple pieces of that uh, as we get started. So Argon has been in computing for a very long time, uh, all the way back in 19, I think this was from 53. 1953, they built their first computer, digital computer, and uh, at that time, there was no computer science department to build the computer. Uh, it was built by physicists uh, for a grand total of uh, $250,000. Uh, and now, uh, of course, the computer that Argonne is installing is upwards of $100 million. And Argonne then had a fledgling computer science group, a math and computer science group. And this picture from 1983 is a wonderful picture because it shows some of the people who you now hear as sort of common names in the community. So in the middle there, division director, so kind of the uh, uh, person uh, with the, maybe it's the pocket protector here, I don't know, um, is Paul Messina, who now leads the Exascale program for the United States, uh, the, uh, the Exascale Computing Project. Uh, you can also see on the far left, Jack Dungara, uh, who you know from Top 500 and uh, uh, Scalable Math Libraries. Uh, right kind of slightly behind him is Rusty Lusk, who you'll see uh, giving a talk later. So Argon has been doing this sort of computing for a very long time, uh, but one of the things that we recognize quickly and that everyone has recognized is that development of code takes a long time, and it actually uh, takes maybe years, and in some cases decades, for a very large piece of code, yet our computers only live for five years. So it's sometimes been described as sort of this half-life paradox that by the time that you port your code to the computer and optimize it for the computer, half of its effective life is gone. You're only using it on the bottom half of its, of its life. So this is, in some sense, why you're here is that to develop scalable codes to, to write uh, and to do computational science, we have to do it in a very efficient, human efficient way so that we can squeeze out those years, which is worth millions of dollars actually, right? So our supercomputer that we're, we're, we will be getting, about $100 million, it lasts about five years. Now you can do the math on how much per year uh, just the effort of you know, computer, of porting your code and getting it ready for the computer. So I encourage everyone this next week plus to not just take detailed notes about what is happening, but take time to think about the concepts and, and really push your speakers with hard questions. Not about you know, what the compiler flag should be, but why. You know, how do I figure out what the best way to optimize a piece of code is? Or why would I choose that method over another method? 
So I'll give you some examples now of the challenges, since this is the hardware section we're starting with this morning. So one of the big challenges that's happening in computing, and it isn't talked about a whole lot, is that one of the foundations, the foundations of parallel computing is equal work is equal time. This is how we write almost all code. We say, oh, I'm going to divide it up into equal chunks of work. They'll execute in the same amount of time, and then I'll do a barrier or a synchronization or a reduction. The problem is, and this is a huge problem for the community, and one that the next days you guys should really be thinking about, is that equal work is not equal time on modern CPUs. This is uh, from a PhD student who's still working on her PhD at UIUC. Fantastic work. This is one example of a, uh, a DGEM, a, a dense uh, um, matrix operation. And it shows in a histogram form the variability because of turbo boost, because of other things, in the computing hardware. So in one machine, Stampede, which is in Texas, you see that it goes all the way from you know maybe uh, uh, 245 to 260 in terms of how long it takes for iterations to complete on different pieces of hardware. You see for Edison and Cab, an even greater spread. And then you see what's really bad for parallel computing, this long tail. So that means that these processors here are finishing way ahead of these processors over here. So equal work is equal time is no longer the first attack that you can always guarantee, oh, I'm going to finish up right away, and equal work, equal time, easy to do uh, for your algorithm. So you have to start thinking about what happens when the work is not balanced, or the CPUs are not balanced. So that's something to think about this week. Another thing to think about this week is what's happening in the industry. You saw that Intel spent uh, uh, billions of dollars. Uh, I don't know, is, is James in the room yet? Do we, can we ask him how, how much it was this worth? It was like 16 billion or 15 billion dollars, something like that. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, you know, Intel uh, is investing in the future and they bought a company that does FPGAs, and they are going to marry an FPGA and a regular computing platform on the same chip. Okay. Now, you already know about GPUs, and so what this should start to tell you is that in your code, from the beginning, the hardware view of the machine is that there will be heterogeneous computing and multiple ways to do loops, multiple ways to do computation. So from the very beginning, I mean, we know what's already happened with GPUs. This is what's going to happen next. There'll be even more of disruptions like this that we have to dive into the code and make sure that the abstractions are at the right level. And finally, one more of these disruptive pieces that will affect the abstractions you use for computing is what's happening in the memory. And so you may have heard that the latest uh, uh, Intel uh, Knight's Landing and then comes after that Knight's uh, Hill and Peak and, and everything else after that is that there's on-package memory. And so there are two classes of memory, the memory that's in the chip and the memory that's off the chip. And now the simplest way for designers to solve this is, okay, we'll make the memory in the chip just a cache. But that's certainly not the best way from an application perspective. So beginning to look at your code and understand the hardware behind how would I allocate memory in different pools? How would I decide what arrays and variables go in which parts of memory and that I'm not just doing a malloc and expecting something to work out? And then, of course, we have NVRAM, which is also now part of the computing system. So these three pieces make up some of the disruption that's happening and set the stage for the hardware discussions this week. So let me sum up here with some of the things to try and shoot for this week. So first, OPM. OPM, it's always good practice to start by using other people's math libraries. If you're writing a dense matrix uh, or, or a sparse matrix uh, and, and you're not working for a team where that's what you're studying, uh, you've probably made a mistake. Uh, you, should, you should find the library. Just find the library, right? People have spent 20, 30 PhDs worth of time optimizing these things. Find the library and plug it in. 
uh, work very hard on encapsulation, on separating the parallelism and the messaging from the core math piece or computational piece that you're trying to solve. And that's where all this hardware discussion that we just had falls into, understanding and determining what those abstractions should be. Work on embedding in your code debugging, performance, correctness, and resilience. That can't come after you write the code. That should be part of your code, all those kinds of flags and pieces you turn on. Later this week, you'll get to talk to folks who work on debugging or performance uh, tools. Keep in mind your two workflows, the science and the programmer workflow. Uh, you need to be able to have uh, maintain both. And finally, make sure that you work quite hard on an automation system for build, for testing, for configuration. Do you know your code is correct? Have you introduced a subtle error? Um, how do you check for those things? There's v tremendous value in spending time on those pieces because they let you do the science faster once you've built those pieces. So summing up some of the difficulties and challenges in the hardware section this week, so this hierarchical memory, on-chip, off-chip, NVRAM, how, from an algorithmic standpoint, should you be looking at those things? How will you tackle that? Will you just assume it's all flat and hope that the hardware does the right thing? Or is this an, something you can encapsulate in how you do iterations? Um, how will you handle heterogeneity? Uh, um, just choosing compiler options is not the final answer to this. You really need to understand and think about your code and how you might have different pieces of computing hardware solving your problem? How would you encapsulate that? And finally, as I pointed out earlier, chips are no longer uh, uh, at a fixed clock rate. They just run at different clock speeds because both of the silicon process, but also the uh, turbo boost and other technologies that try and speed it up when possible and slow it down when they get too hot. This introduces variability and your code you have to understand that variability from a hardware perspective, but then your code has to adapt to that variability.